The last time we talked about vaccines, which we can use to make you immune to virus infection. So you take a vaccine before you get infected, with one exception. Does anyone remember what that is? Rabies. So rabies, you can actually be immunized after you've been bitten because it has a long incubation period. But for most other, all other infections that I know of, once you acquire an infection, a vaccine cannot be used. It's not useful. So then we turn to antiviral drugs. And these can stop infections once they've started. Of course, as you will see, they're difficult for acute infections because they're so fast that you don't have a lot of time because you need to have your antiviral a certain number of hours after infection has begun. We've been working on antivirals for over 50 years, but we really don't have that many. We have about 100 or so. So there are not a lot of antivirals compared to antibiotics. If you go and look at the FDA site and look at all the antibiotics we have, hundreds and hundreds of them. We need about 100 antivirals. Most of them are against these three viruses, HIV, hepatitis C virus, and all the different herpes viruses, herpes simplex, cytomegalovirus, Epstein-Barr, et cetera. But why are there so few antivirals? One of the reasons has to do with the fact that we stated a long time ago that viruses are obligate intracellular parasites. They have to use a lot of the host machinery in order to replicate. And any time you inhibit something, you're, you're likely to impinge on the cell, and therefore you're going to get side effects. So you have to find functions that are specific for the virus, and that limits you. Whereas with bacteria, anything that you target is unique to the bacterium, pretty much. So viruses, you have a few things you can target, like proteases and polymerases. But even with the polymerases, the viral polymerases are related to uh, host cell polymerases, so you get side effects. So when there are side effects in the development of a drug, it's thrown away because you can't really use it. Many viruses are difficult to make antivirals against. Um, they're hard to grow in culture. So hepatitis B virus is still very hard to grow. Human papillomaviruses are hard to grow in culture. Uh, only recently were we able to grow noroviruses in culture. So this uh, interferes with, with antiviral development because you have to have a way of showing that your antiviral is effective, right? And uh, animal models are also needed. Not, there aren't animal models for every virus infection, yet the FDA has this rule. You need to show efficacy of an antiviral in two animal models. And for some viruses, that's impossible. There aren't, there aren't two for smallpox, for example. And then, of course, many of these viruses are dangerous. Ebola and Lassa, as you know, are dangerous. So it really limits the, the number of antivirals we have at, at several levels. But probably a very important is that any antiviral has to completely block virus replication. Now, most of the pharmaceuticals that we take, not antivirals or antimicrobials, aren't 100% efficacious. You know, so for whatever it is that Tylenol does to you, it isn't 100% effective at doing that. But you don't need 100%. It's still good enough to be 75 or whatever percent effective. But viruses, the antivirals have to be 100% effective. Otherwise, you'll get a little bit of virus replication and you'll select for resistant mutants. You know, so Tylenol, if you have a little bit of a headache left, it doesn't really matter. You still feel better, to make the analogy. But it's not good for antivirals. You're going to get resistant mutants. So you have to have very, very strong inhibition. It has to be very potent. And it's really hard to do. So here's an example of this. Here is virus replication. Uh, this is in an animal of some kind. Uh, over time, and the drug is given, and you see there are three different doses of drug, and the red lines are viral replication or the amount of virus present. So if you can see, if you give a good amount, the optimal dose of the antiviral blocks replication, but if you give an intermediate dose, you get a little bit of replication, uh, and then very quickly, resistant variants emerge, and you get a lot of replication, and even more so with a low dose. So in a person or an animal, if your drug isn't 100% effective at inhibiting virus replication, uh, you're going to get resistant mutants. It's simply not going to work. So partial activity isn't an option. 
Another reason why we have so many, so few antiviral drugs is that acute infections are difficult to diagnose and treat. Now, one of the problems is that they're short in duration, right? Influenza, uh, the infectious period is done very quickly. And often by the time you're sick, by the time you feel sick, it's too late to treat with an antiviral. All right, so too sick. And also, we don't diagnose them, uh, which is in part because it's too hard to, uh, to treat people. But once we develop rapid diagnostics, we'll see many more drugs for acute infections like noroviruses and rhinoviruses and influenza viruses. Now, one approach to this issue, so as you know, we've talked about acute virus infections. They're, they're big public health problems because they spread rapidly through populations. So we'd love to have ways to uh, inhibit them with antiviral drugs. One approach would be to give people uh, drugs prophylactically. So if there's an outbreak here at Columbia of, of a viral infection, right, you could give everybody an antiviral drug and that should stop spread. But this is not a good idea. We generally don't like to give antivirals to healthy people. All right, and that's only going to help select for resistance and if you have any side effects, it's going to amplify it. So having a broad antiviral might help, but in certain outbreak situations, but in general, you just don't want to give everyone a, a, a broad spectrum antiviral. Now, speaking of broad spectrum antivirals, as you know, there are broad spectrum antibiotics. If you have an infection, a physician can start you on one of these before knowing what the actual bacterium is that's infecting you. We don't have any such things for viruses. A couple of years ago, this compound was developed, uh, LJ1001. This is developed by a virologist here at Mount Sinai. His name is Ben Hur Lee. I love his name. He's really a cool guy. And this is a antivirus that targets viruses with a lipid envelope, okay? And it inhibits their replication. So here's a list of different viruses, both enveloped and non-enveloped. So here is the virus uh, and whether it has an envelope or not. You can see all the viruses with a yes for an envelope. Uh, this antiviral inhibits its replication and they're from all diverse families. So this is almost a broad spectrum because it hits a lot of different viruses. It does not inhibit uh, adenoviruses, picornaviruses, or rheoviruses, which don't have envelopes. The way this compound works is that it inserts into the lipid membrane of the virus and trashes it. It basically breaks it up. So here is the structure of this compound. And this, these are three electron micrographs of vesicular stomatitis virus particles uh, treated with this antiviral. So here is uh, virus particles treated with just the, uh, the solvent DMSO. Um, and this is another antiviral that has no activity. You can see the particles are intact. But here are particles treated with LJ001. The envelope is gone. All that's left is nucleocapsid. So this antiviral trashes the envelope. It breaks it, basically, and kills infectivity. Now, I talked with Ben Hur a while ago about this. He doesn't think this will ever be licensed because they really don't understand uh, how it works and whether there would be any toxicity and so forth. But um, you can see that something like this would be needed to target all viruses. When you add this to cells, it doesn't, it doesn't have any cytotoxic effects. And we don't understand why. But one of the ideas is that the cell membrane in a cell is always turning over, right? So if you trash it, it gets regenerated very quickly. Whereas in a virus, you got one to start with. And if you trash it, that's the end. You can't make a new one. But this kind of uncertainty is one of the reasons why this, this compound won't get uh, approved. But it's a proof of principle. So there are certain things that you can target. But the problem is, among all the viruses, there's, there's very little in common. Of course, there is in the cell, but you can't target that. So we started looking for antivirals in the early 50s. Uh, by then, we had made lots of antibacterials, you know, starting with the penicillins. And that was very, very successful. Uh, so chemists started taking derivatives of the antibacterials and seeing if they would inhibit viruses. Uh, so for example, the sulfonamide antibiotics for bacteria were modified and looked at for antiviral activity. 
Um, some of them were synthesized and were active against pox viruses, which by still after World War II were still a threat. Remember, they weren't eradicated until 1979, so people uh, still tried to develop antivirals for pox viruses. And just as an aside, just a few years ago, the U.S. commissioned several companies to develop new antivirals against smallpox for use in case of a bioterrorism threat. So these are all stockpiled now. Two different antivirals are stockpiled. You know, millions and millions of doses should there be an outbreak. This was a very controversial issue because there's no animal model for testing these antivirals. Um, they were tested against some other viruses that are related to smallpox. We don't actually know if in an outbreak they will work against smallpox. So this was a really interesting story. In the 1960s and 70s, we switched to what we call blind screening assays. So here we take um, mixtures of compounds and just see if they inhibit uh, viral replication. So you just take a virus and you infect a cell and you add compounds to it and you see if you get inhibition. So these are random chemicals that a company might have. You know, companies, pharmaceutical companies have thousands of thousands of chemicals in their libraries that they save whenever a chemist makes something, they keep it. So those are called chemical libraries. You can also look at natural products. You go outside, you take some dirt, you culture it and you take the, the supernatant and you could throw it on your cells and see if it uh, inhibits viruses. And that in fact works because there are lots of bacteria and fungi in the soil uh, that produce uh, uh, antiviral compounds. You then could identify hits, or, which are either compounds or mixtures that would inhibit replication. Then you have to purify the active ingredient. Uh, the chemists have to then synthesize it and then modify it to make it better. Um, you want to reduce, so whatever you start with is not going to be optimal. It might have a little toxicity, so the chemists try and take that away. You want it to be soluble. Uh, you want it to be bioavailable. If you have to take it orally, you want to make sure it gets to the right place where your virus infection is going to be. Uh, and you also want it to be stable. You don't want it to degrade in a few hours. And all these things are addressed by the chemists. They can look at a molecule and say, okay, we'll put these side groups here and it'll make it last longer. You go back in the lab, you see if it still has antiviral properties. Sometimes it loses it and you go back and say, no, nope, do it again. So there's this wonderful collaboration between the virologist and the, and the chemist. These screens went on for many years, and uh, a lot of work was done, but didn't really amount to much. Uh, one exception is this molecule here uh, called amantadine. Uh, and this was approved in the 1960s to treat uh, influenza virus infections. In fact, we still use amantadine today in certain cases to treat influenza virus. So this was licensed for the treatment of flu, but we had no clue what the mechanism was. We didn't find that out uh, until later. Today, the uh, antiviral program is really different from this. You don't just take mixtures of chemicals and blindly look for inhibitors. You do a very focused approach. And this is in part uh, because we have recombinant DNA technology and really, really good chemistry to make different compounds. So for example, you could say, I want to make an antiviral that targets a viral protease. You can take the viral gene for the protease, you can produce it in cells, show that it's active, and then design assays to look for inhibitors. Um, and we can look at the inhibitors interacting with the proteases. We can do structural work, you know, three-dimensional x-ray crystallography and so forth, and that really informs uh, how we do this. We know a lot about the life cycles of viruses, as you've seen uh, in this course. So you can say we want to target very specific places. And even viruses that can't be grown readily, we can use approaches to uh, target them. If you can focus on a specific gene, you don't have to worry about growing a virus, at least in these initial uh, screens for antiviral. So uh, the, what we do now is quite impressive in terms of antiviral discovery, and that's why the numbers are, are, are going up. If you look at the replication cycle of a virus in a cell, as you know, there are different steps that viruses need to go through. They need to attach and enter cells. They need to be translated. They need to replicate their genomes and assemble. And each of these is a target for antiviral discovery. As I've told you, we have fusion and entry inhibitors. Uh, interferon uh, can interfere with the translation of some viruses, some viral mRNAs. Uh, the enzymes that replicate viral genomes, whether they be DNA or RNA, uh, 
or reverse transcriptases can be inhibited with a variety of nucleoside or non-nucleoside analogs. We have a variety of protease inhibitors for HIV and HCV as well. And finally, neuraminidase uh, inhibitors. Neuraminidase functions in the release of virus from cells, and we'll look at that in a moment. How do you get to a, a drug? Well, you start with identifying a medical need, of course. It's very important. If your infection, like I said last time for vaccines, if your virus only kills five people a year in the U.S., you will not have any company making a vaccine uh, or an antiviral. I mean, you can even go beyond that. It, it, it's unfortunate, but Ebola killed you know, uh, hundreds of people in Africa for many years, and no one wanted to make a vaccine until we had this huge recent outbreak. So, you know, the, the driver is often uh, a monetary one. But once you have a medical need, uh, then you do some research and identify targets. Where in that replication cycle do you want to target an inhibitor? So let's say you find a gene that you want to inactivate with an antiviral. The first thing you have to do is, is prove that this gene is essential. You have to take it out of the virus if you can and show that the virus won't replicate. Because if it's not essential, then it would be a waste of time for you to design an antiviral against it. Uh, then once you've proven that, you can, do a little, you can do some structure studies on that protein to understand how it works. Uh, then you would start your screens. You could do natural product. You could make collections of, of chemistry products, RNAi even, uh, and do a variety of screens based on the, the uh, activity of the protein you're looking at. You can even do in silico screens. If you have the structure of the protein, you can ask what compounds can I model into it and have the chemists use that. Uh, from all this work, you would then make a lead compound, something that inhibits your protein or your activity. And then the chemists go to work on it. They modify it uh, to get various properties. You want it to get to the right place. As I've said, that's bioavailability. You want it to persist long enough. That's uh, the pharmacokinetics. And will it be safe? Uh, you, it, it, the toxicity has to be low. And you test that first in cells, and then you go into animals. A whole variety of animals you ask, is it toxic? And many drugs die at this stage because they're too toxic. At some point, you will have a lead compound that's been modified extensively to satisfy all of these properties here. Uh, and then you will move into animal models to see if it works to prevent infection. So far, you've just looked at cell culture. And now these are called the preclinical phases where you're in an animal model. This can take years as well. And if you have good results, then finally you can move into human studies, which can take many years. And these are divided into the phases of clinical trials, phases one, two, and three. This is all very expensive and time consuming. And if you can start with 100,000 or so compounds, uh, you reject many of them because they don't have antiviral effects. You reject many. Uh, on early on for, for toxicity. Uh, you, have, you reject those which don't have antiviral effects in animals. You reject some for toxicity. If you're lucky to get into humans, uh, you probably wouldn't put anything into humans that ha had a bad profile in animals. But sometimes a drug, when placed in humans in a phase one, which is just for safety, few, few numbers of people, you will find toxicity as well, and you have to end the program. And look, you've already gone maybe 10 years, and you've spent hundreds of millions of dollars. So this is another reason why antivirals are, are few in number. It's really costly. And whatever company is developing it needs to see, down the line, making enough money to recover these costs. Companies are in business to make profits. Most of them are, are, are public companies. that are, Their stock is traded, and they have to uh, answer to their stockholders. Now, in the, in the ideal world, wealthy governments would make antivirals and give them to everyone else. That, I think, would be the ideal situation, but that doesn't work. So let's talk a little bit about the kinds of screens you might do to look for antiviral drugs. Here's an example of a mechanism-based screen. You're looking for a protease inhibitor. You have a viral protease you've identified that's essential for replication, and you want to find a drug that will block its activity. So here, what we have done is to design a substrate for the protease. So these are amino acids, A, B, C, and D. And there's a cleavage site for your protease there. You attach these amino acids to a bead so you can separate them out rap rapidly. And then there is a, uh, a light bulb at the other end, some 
fluorescent chemical or some kind of uh, readout that you can uh, image very quickly. So if you add the protease to this substrate, uh, it will cleave it. And you spin out uh, this part with the bead on it. And then you can measure the soluble portion, which will make light. And that's shown here in this uh, graph on the right. We're looking at fluorescence intensity of the soluble peptide versus time. So again, the soluble peptide's released. You spin down what's left. Uh, with the bead on it, and then you just take the supernatant and measure it. And you can very quickly measure the activity, and then you can test for different inhibitors. You add different chemicals to this reaction, and if your inhibitor is inhibiting the protease, you will be left with the bead attached to the uh, fluorescent inhibitor, uh, the fluorescent molecule, and when you centrifuge it, you'll remove all the activity and you'll see nothing in the supernatant because no cleavage is occurring. So this is the kind of assay you can develop and you can make a high throughput version of it where you, you test thousands and thousands of compounds in a day because it can be automated uh, and the results are very straightforward. It, much easier than starting with a virus, infecting a cell and looking for protease inhibitors because you, you wouldn't be able to target a specific part of the replication cycle. So here's an example. That was a in vitro screen where we just have purified material. Here's an example of a cell-based screen or you can use bacteria to look for antivirals. So in this case, what we have here is a tetracycline uh, efflux protein. This is a protein in the membrane of tetracycline-resistant bacteria. Tetracycline, as you know, is an antibiotic. It inhibits bacteria. If the bacteria carry this efflux protein, it pumps out the tetracycline as soon as it gets in, so the it makes the bacteria resistant to the antibiotic. What's been done here is to engineer an HIV protease cleavage site in one of these loops in this efflux protein. You can see it's a multiple transmembrane protein. And someone years ago found that these loops are essential for activity. So you can put an HIV protease site in here. And then it will be cleaved when you produce the HIV protease in these bacteria. It will cleave this protein and it will make the cells sensitive to set tetracycline. So for example, if we have um, the, the HIV protease produced in these cells. It will cleave the efflux protein. And if you plate the bacteria on agar with tetracycline, you won't get any colonies. So this is a really nice readout. Do you get colonies or not? Uh, if you have now added an inhibitor of the protease, it prevents cleavage of this loop, and now you will get colonies, bacteria growing in the presence of tetracycline. So again, a very rapid way to screen many, many compounds to see if you can inhibit this protease activity. There are many more like this that have been designed. Uh, of course, many of them are proprietary and we don't know about because the companies won't tell us. But people can be very clever with this. How about the compounds themselves? You can, you can screen many compounds with these approaches. Uh, as I said, companies have chemical libraries. Every compound they've ever made for whatever use over the years, you can screen. Uh, in these, and you can screen many compounds a day. You can still look at natural products. You have to go outside and collect things and grow them and make broths from them. You can do combinatorial chemistry. There's some very clever chemistry that's been developed where you can design uh, thousands and thousands of different molecules uh, which you can then use in your screen. And here's one example where you use uh, different linkers and attach to them uh, different fragments. So uh, here are the linkers here. And then you attach different fragments, which are chemical side groups uh, of various sorts. And you can make a whole matrix of this very quickly. And you can then test those for binding to your antiviral in your assay. You can also do structure-based design. You can use the three-dimensional structure of a protein determined by x-ray crystallography to tell you what the chemical should look like. So if you're lucky and you have the ligand, the natural ligand, inserted into the protein, you can try and mimic that chemically. You can also do what's called in silico screening. You let a computer take the active site of a protein and design molecules that will fit in, and then the chemists can follow up and actually make them and see if they work. And this has actually uh, turned out to be fruitful in a number of cases. The screening we do today is all roboticized. You have screening done in plastic plates with many, many wells in them. You've probably heard of 96 well plates. Well, this plate has over a thousand and because you can do these assays individually in these plates and put a different compound in every well for example everything is added 
uh, to the plates by a robot. There's no, no person standing there with a pipette man and putting a thousand. It would take you years, right? So this robot, you program it, and it just zips down and puts everything into the wells. Uh, then another robot shown here picks up each plate, shoves it in an incubator. When the time's up, it takes it out and puts it in a reader. And you could be sitting home on Sunday morning and uh, getting your results for your latest antiviral screen. It's really quite impressive what's done now. All right, uh, the first question is, we have many antibiotics, but fewer antivirals. What is a reason for the difference? One, robotic screening is slow. Two, there are few serious viral infections. Three, resistance is a problem. Four, antivirals must be potent. Five, all of the above. All right, most of you got, 56% of you got D. Antivirals must be potent. The first two are wrong, of course. Um, so resistance would arise after you have your drugs on the market. So that's not a reason why we don't have a lot of drugs. It limits their usefulness in terms of time. And we'll talk more about resistance in a moment. But it's not a reason why we would have a few antivirals. They must be potent. And can't be all of the above, because robotic screening is not slow, as I tried to emphasize. And there are a few serious viral infections. is certainly not true. All right, let's talk about resistance. Basically, any antiviral you make, you will get resistance to it, because viruses replicate at high levels, as you know, and the mutation frequencies are quite high. We've alluded to this a few times in this course. We'll go into it in a bit. And this is particularly a problem for chronic viral infections, for which we have the most antivirals, and which we treat for long periods of time. HIV, HCV, HBV infected patients are treated for years with antivirals. It's a perfect scenario for selecting uh, resistance. In fact, we have, as I said, about 100 antiviral drugs. We've got resistance to all of them already. And that's kind of scary because we don't have a lot. And if, you get, if you're treating a patient with an antiviral and you get resistance, often you don't have a lot of options to switch. So that doesn't mean that's not good news for the patient. Patient can't, you can't treat with the same drug, obviously, if you get resistance. So what happens would, in HIV, in the early days, you would treat the patients. They would get better as measured by the rise in their CD4 T lymphocyte counts. And then all of a sudden, they would crash, and you would have resistant viruses in them. Um, if you don't have another drug, as we didn't in the early days of HIV therapy, you can't stop infection. Now, the good news is when you get resistance, we can study it and we can figure out what is going on, and sometimes this helps us to make new antivirals or do things to get around it, as you will see. Now, RNA viruses, all nucleic acid polymerases, of course, are error-prone, and RNA viruses don't have error correction mechanisms, so they make the most errors of any polymerase. Uh, one misincorporation in 10,000 to 100,000 nucleotides. And that's about a million times greater than, host, than the, the mutation frequency of our genome. And, and so that means in, an, in a genome of 10 KB, an RNA genome of 10 KB, you get uh, one mutation in one to 10 genomes. Every time the genome replicates, in fact, you get at least one mutation. Now, DNA polymerases, uh, they also make mistakes, just like RNA polymerases, but there are mechanisms for removing misincorporated nucleotides and replacing them. So polymerases uh, will make mistakes shown by this mismatch here. We have a polymerase copying a strand of DNA in, in right to left direction. And there's a, an error made, which happens with some frequency. But we have exonucleases and systems that detect the errors. They will chew back the mismatch and fix it. So for that reason, DNA viruses make fewer errors. And they evolve more slowly as a consequence. So, uh, resistant, resistance is still a problem with DNA viruses, but far less so than for RNA viruses. Let's talk about uh, some specific antivirals now, and we'll talk a little bit about resistance in the context of them. Now, in the middle of this slide, which is shaded yellow and you can't see well, are the four bases, A, G, C, and T. And of course, this would be for DNA. If it, would be, if it were RNA, it would be U. And around them are, are shown many of the uh, nucleotide analogs, nucleotide or nucleoside, depending on the phosphates present, uh, which have been synthesized as inhibitors. So you can see there are derivatives of A and G uh, and T and C of different sorts. And they have different mod chemical modifications, which are shown in red, which make them different from the original nucleotide. Uh, 
and that is what makes them effective inhibitors. So let's look at uh, acyclovir, which is a very good anti-herpes simplex virus drug. So acyclovir is a derivative of guanosine. You can see the ribose sugar at the bottom here has been replaced uh, with a very different looking chemical, chemical moiety. That's called acyclovir. And there are also second generation derivatives called gancyclovir. We call acyclovir a prodrug because it has to be modified before it is active. So here is acyclovir on the left again, the same molecule I just showed you. And in order for this to be incorporated by the DNA polymerase of the virus, this has to be phosphorylated. Now, typically phosphorylated uh, nucleosides can't be taken up into the cell. So if you give a, a non-phosphorylated form, which is what acyclovir is, this will be taken up into the cell, and then it will be phosphorylated in the cell. The beauty of acyclovir is that the first step of phosphorylation, the first addition, is done by a viral enzyme, the herpes simplex virus thymidine kinase. HSV1TK, and only the kinase will do this. It's a very, very specific reaction. And then the cell takes over and adds the next two phosphates. There are two different kinases of the cell that add the second and third phosphate. So this makes this very specific for virus-infected cells, because in an uninfected cell, that first phosphate will not be added, so there'll be uh, no inhibition. Once this compound is triphosphorylated, it can now be utilized by the viral DNA polymerase, and it's incorporated into DNA. But because most of the ribose ring is gone, there's no place to attach the second, the, the next triphosphate in the synthesis, and chain extension stops. So these are what we call chain terminators. They're incorporated by the polymerase into growing DNA, and then they cannot be added to, and so DNA synthesis stops. And here's guanosine for comparison. You can see the hydroxyl group there, which is where you'd add the next triphosphate or the next base. And that's simply not present in acyclovir, and that's why it's a good inhibitor. And of course, this happens, this inhibition, this chain termination only happens in virus-infected cells because only the viral TK gene, the TK protein, which is a kinase, can add the phosphate to acyclovir. Now, this was a very successful compound, uh, but it wasn't very orally bioavailable. So for serious herpes simplex infections, you want to deliver the drug orally sometimes. And so what they did was simply to modify it. Here's a acyclovir, and they added, added a valine uh, to this chemical moiety at the lower left, and that's called valacyclovir. And amazingly, when you take this orally, it's, it's very bioavailable compared with acyclovir. And after you take it orally, uh, the valine is actually cleaved off and the acyclovir is released, so you get very good levels in the blood. So it's an example of how you can do chemistry after the original compound and make the compound better. Yes? Um, was the acyclovir in ointment form? Was it topical? It can be, yes. It can be topical. If, if you have encephalitis, it could be injected. But there were some cases where they wanted to give it orally. It wasn't working well, so this was made, and this is much more bioavailable. So if you're going to get an oral, Herpes medicine, you'll get valcyclovir, otherwise acyclovir or gancyclovir as a topical ointment even today. Now, we do uh, see some acyclovir resistance, especially in people who use this long term. They, they, these mutants uh, occur, and some of them cannot phosphorylate the prodrug, and they're in the TK. All right, so TK changes, the TK changes just enough so it doesn't phosphorylate. Uh, acyclovir, and it's resistant because it's not incorporated. Uh, there are also some mutations in the viral DNA polymerase. These have normal TK, they phosphorylate acyclovir, but then the polymerase has an amino acid change that prevents it from using acyclovir uh, as a triphosphate, so there's no ter chain termination. All right, so these are two different kinds of mutations that were, that were discovered in the study of acyclovir-resistant mutants, and it allows you, if you want, to go on and, and make modifications that might uh, get around that. Now, uh, these are a real problem in AIDS patients. AIDS patients, of course, are immunosuppressed as a consequence of HIV infection, and one of the infections they often get are very serious herpes simplex virus infections. You want to treat them with acyclovir, and they often develop resistance. Um, and if that's the case, it's a real problem because the alternative is a drug called Foscarnet, which is shown at the upper right. Um, 
this is a DNA polymerase inhibitor, but it has serious, more serious side effects. Acyclovir is, is a very good drug in terms of very, having very low side effects. Fuscarnet is not. And sometimes the uh, mutations in the DNA polymerase that give rise to acyclovir resistance also confer phoscarnet resistance. In that case, you have no way to treat these patients, and they're likely to die of disseminated uh, herpes simplex infection. So it just underscores the serious nature uh, of resistance to antivirals. Uh, the other drug that I wanted to talk to you about is, is Symmetrel or amantadine, which we talked about, discovered in the early 60s and the 90s. It was found that it inhibits the viral M2 protein, which is an ion channel. If you remember the entry of influenza virus into cells, the virus binds a cell surface receptor. It's taken up into the endosome, and eventually the pH of the endosome drops. That drop in pH is mediated by protons that are pumped into the endosome interior. Uh, then in the virus particle, there's an ion channel, the M2 ion channel, which then takes those protons and pumps them into the interior of the virus particle so that when the viral and cell membranes fuse, the RNA can get out uh, and go into the nucleus. If the interior of the particle is not acidified, the RNA never gets out. So amantadine actually blocks this ion channel and blocks acidification of the virion interior so the RNA never gets out, and that's why infection doesn't occur. And we didn't know this when this drug was licensed. That's what happens when you do blind screening. So here's a drawing of this drug and the M M2 ion channel. So this is the virus membrane in tan colors, and these blue uh, alpha helices uh, are the M2 ion channel. It's a tetramer of four polypeptides. And again, the ions move through this channel into the, from the endosome into the interior of the virus. And amantadine uh, can plug this channel or bind at the exterior of the channel, and that blocks protons being pumped into the interior. Now we can get resistance to this compound very readily. We get amino acid changes in the M2 that prevent uh, amantadine from binding either in the channel or on either side. And we don't use this drug for flu anymore because we have widespread resistance. Resistance to which antiviral would involve amino acid changes in a viral enzyme? Acyclovir, amantadine, lj one penicillin, or all of the above? Hey, the right answer is acyclovir, which 70% of you got. I'm glad none of you picked penicillin. Is that an antiviral? Good. LJ001 is a antiviral that does what? It's membranes. Amantadine interacts with what? The ion channel. It's not an enzyme, right? It's just a channel. So that's not right. It's acyclovir. And what is the uh, enzyme that would show resistance to acyclovir? Remember? TK, TK right. That, that amantadine is useless for influenza virus, but we have some other uh, influenza virus inhibitors, and they inhibit the neuraminidase. Uh, the neuraminidase is one of the two glycoproteins on the surface of the virus particle. It's actually an enzyme, and its activity is to cleave sialic acid off of cell proteins, and sialic acid is the receptor for the virus. One of the functions of neuraminidase is as the virus, influenza virus is budding from the cell, that cell, of course, has sialic acid on its surface, and those viruses would just stick to the cell surface, but the neuraminidase, and the sialic acid is shown here in red schematically, the neuraminidase cleaves sialic acid off the cell surface so these virions can move away from the cell. So neuraminidase has a function in an entry to cleave the mucus, sialic acids from the mucus in your respiratory tract, and during exit uh, to allow viruses to float free. So the, the structure of sialic acid in the neuraminidase is shown at the right. The neuraminidase is a tetramer, four polypeptides, one, two, three, four, and in the middle is a pocket where sialic acid binds, and then the enzyme cleaves this from the rest of the um, like a protein. So what was done based on this structure was to do in silico modeling and say, let's model a compound that looks like sialic acid and see if it will be an inhibitor. And that's how we got the inhibitors of flu. There are two of them that are used. Uh, Relenza or Zanamivir is on the left, and Oseltamivir or Tamiflu is on the right. And these are both available. 
uh, one is taken orally and one is actually inhaled. And these are designed to mimic sialic acid, so they look more or less like a sialic acid. And the idea was, if you make something that looks very much like sialic acid, you can't make exactly sialic acid because then it would just be sialic acid, and that doesn't work so well as an inhibitor. But if you make it very close, then perhaps the neuraminidase cannot mutate to be resistant because then it wouldn't be able to deal with normal sialic acid during the replication cycle. So how, how has that worked out? Um, well, it turns out that for one of these compounds, we get more resistance than the other. So we do get resistance for both. And here's how they work. Here we have our neuraminidase in purple, and it's binding sialic acid. So the neuraminidase is in the virus particle. Uh, it's, it's, as the particle is released, it's binding sialic acid and cleaving it so the virus particles can leave the surface of the cell. Oseltamivir and zanamivir block the active site and inhibit the neuraminidase so that it cannot cleave sialic acid from the cell, and the viruses stay stuck to the cell surface, so this inhibits replication. But you can see by this cartoon that zanamivir, and the, the other name for zanamivir is relenza, more closely mimics sialic acid than does oseltamivir, shown by these cartoons. Now, what, in terms of resistance, you get more resistance to oseltamivir, tamiflu, than to zanamivir. You get amino acid changes, in the neuraminidase that block binding of the drug, uh, but they don't affect binding of the neuraminidase to sialic acid. Okay, so those are viable mutants, whereas it's harder to get zanamivir mutants. Now, the zanamivir is the one that you inhale, and not, many peop not a lot of people can deal with inhaling a drug. They have respiratory issues, asthma, and so forth. So it's not used anywhere near as much as uh, Tamiflu, because you can take Tamiflu uh, orally. But we do think the lower mutation rate with zanamivir is because it's closer to sialic acid. Now the CDC uh, collects influenza specimens every winter and checks them for resistance to antiviral drugs. And these are the results since October of 2015. All of the viruses out there, H1N1, H3N2, are resistant to the amantadine, so we don't use them anymore. But here we have H1N1's 1,200 samples. Uh, they got uh, 11 resistant viruses out of those 12, 1,200, about 1%. Uh, for also Tamivir and the same. And you see Zanamivir, where, as I said, it looks more like salic acid. We don't have any resistance here. Uh, and the same for influenza H3N2. Uh, we don't have actually resistance to uh, also Tamivir in this set, nor Zanamivir and neither for influenza B. This has been a mild flu season. Normally we have many, many more isolates and more resistance. But you can see uh, among the circulating viruses, the, there are already resistance to Tamiflu. There's another set of compounds that, that are not used clinically, but I want to tell you about them because uh, they have been useful for research. And our understanding of the coronavirus entry has depended on these wind compounds. These are compounds originally synthesized by a company called Sterling Winthrop, hence the name W-I-N. And uh, what they do is they bind in the picornavirus capsid and displace the lipid that's normally there. So you may remember uh, picornaviruses are icosahedral capsids. Here's a cartoon of it at the top. Uh, and um, in the, the receptors of these viruses bind into what we call a canyon in the capsid. Uh, and that's how they interact with the virus particle. And at the bottom of that canyon is a little uh, pocket, if you will. It's expanded here on the lower left. The pocket usually contains lipid. It's the white compound on the right. Uh, but these drugs, these wind compounds, actually displace the lipid, and they fit tightly in the pocket, as shown on the lower left. And this is how we learned that the lipid has to leave the particle in order for uncoating to occur. Because when we treat viruses with these compounds, they displace the lipid and they lock tightly in the pocket and they never leave. So they don't give the capsid flexibility to uncoat. So that's the mechanism of action of these compounds. Unfortunately, they're clinically not useful because, first of all, they're not efficacious. They don't reduce disease all that much. And you get resistance very readily. It's very easy to select for viruses with amino acid changes in this pocket, you just need one amino acid change and the drug no longer binds tightly and it's no longer effective. So none of these have ever been licensed to treat picornavirus uh, infections. But I wanted to just give you a sense of how drug discovery goes. This is an original paper where some of these wind compounds uh, were reported. 
And they started with this compound on the upper left, and they, they began to modify it chemically in a variety of ways. And you can see in the middle, you can see all these different permutations of different side chains that they've added to this. And then they're looking at the minimal inhibitory concentration. And you can see sometimes they, by modifying it, they inactivate it, or they make it better than the original compound. So that's just one illustration. You would try to make the most active compound, but then you want to make sure it has all the other properties that the drug needs, you know, bioavailability, pharmacokinetics, and so forth. Um, and you may not actually end up using the most potent compound. On the right here is another interesting permutation. Here, what they have done is vary the, the number of carbons between the two ends of the molecule. You see there's a phenol ring here at one end and a, and a set of oxygens at the other end. And they've simply added an increasing number of carbons in between and tested each one of these to inhibit picornavirus infection. You can see uh, you start, I think that's three there. It's not active. Four is pretty good. But then when you go up to nine, it becomes inactive again. But, but 10 becomes active again. So there's a lot of randomness to this because you don't know how things are going to work. You don't know how these compounds will fit in. And you can do a lot of computer modeling, and sometimes it just doesn't work out. So that's just an example of how uh, some of this synthesis goes. A lot of chemistry. So if you're interested in chemistry, go work for a pharma company. You can be involved in antiviral, antibacterial, all kinds of drug uh, discovery. You can spend your day making uh, compounds. One of the more exciting new developments in virology antivirals are compounds to treat hepatitis C virus. For many years after its discovery, we only had basically one treatment. We had interferon. And as you know, interferon has side effects, and people did not like this treatment. We now have a, a number of brand new inhibitors uh, for an, uh, HCV. Uh, one of them is shown here, telaprevir, which is an inhibitor of the NS3 protease of hepatitis C virus. So NS3 is this yellow protein in the, in the genome diagram. It cleaves all of these proteins shown by the yellow lines. And they designed this uh, in drug to mimic a peptide that would fit into the active site of the enzyme. So here on the left, lower left is the crystal structure of the protease. And the drug is shown in purple. And it fits right into the active site. It was modeled there initially. Then it was modified by chemists until they got a very active form. And this has been licensed now for treatment. It's very effective. And in fact, we have a bunch of uh, new HCV antivirals. I talked about this one previously, an antagonist of AMIR. AMIR-122 is a liver-specific microRNA, a 21-22 nucleotide microRNA that's required for efficient replication of hep C. It, and that MIR has to bind to the viral RNA. And there is a drug called Miravircin that's been designed to bind up the MIR and prevent it from binding to the viral RNA, and that prevents virus replication. And on the right is a study in humans where they gave uh, five weekly injections of this miravircin into people. Uh, they, they gave the drug or a placebo, and you can see that people who received the placebo had high levels of hep C RNA uh, in serum for 18 weeks, but people who received uh, miravircin had much lower levels uh, of virus RNA. And here are the drugs uh, that are either approved or in the pipeline for hep C. So here, for example, uh, a polymerase inhibitor, an RNA polymerase inhibitor, so Fosbuvir, was approved in 2013. Uh, Telaprevir was approved in 2011. That's a protease inhibitor. And there are two other protease inhibitors approved. But even more interestingly, um, there are some other inhibitors in the pipeline as well. They're in phase two or phase three clinical trials, as you can see. We now have combination therapy, two different drugs with two targets mixed together that are in phase two and phase three uh, trials. This is a way to avoid resistance. And I'll tell you about this more specifically when we talk about HIV uh, antivirals. Among all the viruses, we have the most antivirals for HIV because we have 34 million people on the planet who are infected at this moment, uh, most of them in sub-Saharan Africa, and we need to get drugs to get rid of this infection. Of course, you can't really cure HIV because it's a retrovirus that integrates uh, its DNA, it's a DNA copy of its RNA into the genome. And as you will see later, uh, the cells in which it's integrated persist forever in you, and we can't get rid of them. So even though the antivirals work well, they reduce your virus load and they make you healthy, you can never get rid of infection.
So this slide shows you all the different targets within the cell that we have antivirals. We have antivirals that block attachment and entry, fusion. We have reverse transcriptase inhibitors. We have protease inhibitors, and we have integrase inhibitors. So that's the life cycle of HIV, uh, release of RNA, reverse transcription and integration, and maturation and production of particles. We have every step of the cycle, we've got something. And this is because people spent a lot of time, a lot of companies spent a lot of time working on this, a lot of academic labs as well. And we had a history of studying retroviruses for years, because since Rouse discovered Rouse sarcoma virus, People had been working on retroviruses, and we understood all this basic science. So as soon as HIV was discovered, we knew exactly how it worked in all the different parts of the replicative cycle, and we could start making uh, antivirals right away. Now, the problem with AIDS is that you can be infected for 10 or 20 years. The virus continues to replicate, and it's always spawning mutations. And this is a problem for antiviral therapy. First antiretroviral drug was AZT. Anybody see the Dallas Buyers Club? Yeah. Fantastic story of AZT. The first drug, and you know, some people got it on trials. Here's the cool part about that movie. They wanted to divide it up and share it. And it turned out that that was the way to go because the initial doses were too high. They were giving too much, and it was OK for them to divide up the pills and split it because eventually they realized they needed to use a lower dose. So the, the early trials were crowdsourced uh, in a way. Uh, so this drug was initially discovered as an anti-cancer drug, and it turns out to be a uh, nucleoside analog and a chain terminator. Here's AZT. It's phosphorylated by cellular kinases, and then it's taken up by the reverse transcriptase and acts as a chain terminator. So you can see it's chemically different. It's azido-deoxythymidine. There's the azido group, the N3 right there. It's very different from a normal, which would have a hydroxyl here. And it's, once it's incorporated into the DNA by RT, uh, it terminates the chain extension. Now, this is phosphorylated by cellular enzymes. So it also gets into uninfected cells and will inhibit their DNA synthesis as well. So it has a lot of side effects. And that was the, one of the problems uh, with this drug. It has a lot of side effects. You can take it orally, but look, the half-life is an hour. This is really bad for a drug. And, uh, you know, we were desperate initially, so this was licensed, but one hour is really bad. You had to dose patients two or three times a day, um, and they got so sick that they would stop taking it for a few days until they felt better, and then they would start again, and that's a perfect way to select for resistant mutants. Because you take the drug, you have a few mutant viruses that are present, you stop, they amplify, and then when you come back with taking your drug again, you can't inhibit them. So we got lots of resistance, and eventually you couldn't use uh, AZT anymore. After, immediately after licensure, single amino acid changes in the RT, uh, and these do not bind the phosphorylated form. So we started developing new analogs, and they're didanosine, zalcitabine, stavudine, lam lamivudine, et cetera, you know, derivatives of I and C and T. And people started combining the drugs, and they used two at a time. But even with that, uh, within a year or so, we got resistance to both drugs. So obviously, two wasn't the solution. Uh, people started making other inhibitors, and these are called non-nucleoside RT inhibitors. So here's the crystal structure of reverse transcriptase. And here is the active site right here in red in the palm domain. So that's where new triphosphates are added. So these chain terminators get incorporated into the exact active site, and they're put into the actual growing DNA, and they terminate chain synthesis. The non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors bind a little bit away from the active site. They don't actually get incorporated into the DNA, but they bind near the active site, and they deform it a little so that it's no longer able to polymerize nucleotides. And three examples are shown here, uh, nevirapine, delaverdine, and efavirenz. And this is the actual chemical name for nevirapine here. And so you can see this is why they make shorter names. But the names they make, I can't even pronounce. So this is sold as viramune. And then there's a trade name, which is nevirapine. All right, so these were introduced. And of course, 
mutants were selected rapidly to these NNRITs, and these were simply amino acid substitutions in uh, the parts of the RT that bind the drug, right? So all you need is one amino acid change and the drug is not going to bind anymore. So we can't use these anymore except in combination therapy. As you'll see, we can use some of these drugs together with two other drugs, and they're very effective. We have protease drugs. These are among, also among the, the earliest uh, inhibitors for HIV develop. We know that the protease is absolutely required for HIV replication. Um, remember the maturation process of retroviruses. You have the synthesis of a GAG precursor, uh, and the molecules, the matrix, the capsid, the nucleocapsid, are all assembled at the membrane and buds out to form a new virus particle. You also make a gag pol protein, which includes the enzyme RT and integrase, but also the protease, PR, shown in yellow here. And the protease is incorporated uh, into the virus particle. And it ends up making final cleavages in the capsid uh, to mature the particle. So the protease is needed at multiple sites uh, during the replication. So very early on, people made mutations in the sequence encoding the protease, and they found that destroyed virus infectivity. So it was a good target for antiviral discovery. And these are some of the drugs that target the uh, HIV protease. These are called peptidomimetics. And all they do is they chemically mimic the part of the protein that's the substrate for the protease. So here, for example, here is the natural substrate of the protease. It's a sequence of amino acids. And between tyrosine and proline, you have the cleavage site. That's where the protease works. So they took the chemical structure of this sequence and they made chemical mimics. One of them is sequinavir on the lower left. And if you look, you can see that the cleavage site is there. And even to the left, you have a chemical mimic almost exactly of these amino acids. Then you have some other groups on either side, which presumably make this a very high affinity binder to the protease. Another one at the right is darunavir. Same idea. And they fit into the protease. On the right is the crystal structure of the HIV protease. Uh, and in purple is one of these inhibitors you can see binding in the active site. So these are very, uh, very potent inhibitors of the protease, and they effectively inhibit virus replication. And of course, resistance to those are also encountered when you use them individually. So all of these inhibitors were initially developed, used on their own, and then re resistance arose uh, within a year. They're also inhibitors of the integrase. Remember, the integrase is the other viral enzyme, besides the RT, RNase, H, that's responsible for integrating the DNA copy of the retroviral genome into the cellular genome. So here, just to remind you, uh, we have double-stranded retroviral DNA on the upper right. Uh, it's going to integrate into the cellular target, which is purple. And the integrase makes NICs in the target DNA, ligates the retroviral DNA to it, and then the uh, gaps are filled in. So these two drugs, raltegravir and daltegravir, they both inhibit the integration step precisely. And again, you can imagine that having the enzymes purified, we can screen for compounds that inhibit them and bring them through all the stages to licensing in people. And these enzymes bind the integrase enzyme. Sorry, these inhibitors bind the integrase enzyme. And on the bottom, are a series of panels showing you uh, what these inhibitors do. So on the left, we have the structure of um, the integrase, which is in yellow. And in purple uh, is the retroviral DNA, the 3 prime N, which is about to invade host cell DNA. So this is going to, uh, the host cell DNA will be nicked, and this 3 prime N will be ligated to one of the host DNA strands. And this is in the absence of drug. And the two subsequent panels are the same structure, but with raltegravir and daltegravir, the purple and the green structures. And what you can see is the, the drug binds right in this active site of the integrase in both cases, and it moves the 3 prime hydroxyl of the viral DNA away from where it should be. So the 3 prime end is kind of sticking out here in, towards you because the drug is in there interfering with it. So the 3 prime end of the DNA cannot any longer integrate into the host cell DNA. So that's how these enzymes work. They deform the active site so that the enzyme doesn't work anymore. Again, these are active, but again, uh, resistance emerges quite readily. 
And one more I want to tell you, which is quite interesting, Maraviroc, which is an inhibitor of CCR5. Now, CCR5, you may remember, is one of the two receptors that the virus needs to get into cells. It attaches to CD4 and then CCR5. Um, and you need both of them to get virus into the cell. And that's cartooned on the upper right. We see the viral glycoprotein, GP120, binding to CCR5. Maraviroc is a small compound shown in yellow, which binds CCR5. And it deforms the binding site on CCR5 for the viral glycoprotein. So you cannot get high affinity binding of the virus to CCR5, and you get very, very much reduced entry. So it's a really interesting concept. All the other uh, sites we've been talking about for inhibition so far have been enzymes. But here is actually a virus receptor can be a target for an antiviral. And again, this works, but you get resistance when you use it in infected people. OK, which of the following targets for HIV antivirals inhibits the earliest stage of infection? Nucleoside inhibitors, NNRTIs, CCR5 inhibitors, integrase inhibitors, or fusion inhibitors? All right, 68% of you got C, CCR5 inhibitors. And that, of course, is the earliest part of the infectious cycle. That's the binding of the virus to the CCR5 receptor. Everything else happens after that. Nucleoside inhibitors, NNRTIs, that's way downstream when we're doing reverse transcription. Uh, integrase inhibitors is even farther downstream. And of course, fusion happens after receptor binding. So the answer is C for those reasons. So what we have today now that works really, really well for HIV, we'll talk a little bit more about this later, is combination therapy. And this is called highly active antiretroviral therapy, or HART. And in this way, we can actually treat HIV or AIDS as a chronic disease. We can treat people for their whole life, keep their viral loads low, and they can remain healthy and live presumably a full life. And many people have, have done so. We typically make a pill with three different inhibitors in it that target a different mechanism. And you've seen how um, we have antivirals against every step in the life cycle or the replication cycle of HIV, so it's possible to use this. So early on, the experience with getting resistance said to us, we have to do something, and, and people thought of the idea of combination. First, they tried two different antivirals. That didn't work. We got resistance. But three seems to be the magic number. Unless you stop taking your drug, it's very difficult to get resistance to three at a time. It's not that it never happens. It does happen, but it's extremely, it's extremely rare. So let's go over the math. So this is an idealized situation. One muta let's assume we need one mutation to be resistant to a drug. The mutation rate is one in every 10,000 bases polymerized. All right. Now, the mutation rate might be lower, so that's the highest mutation rate that we could have. So in other words, every base in the genome is going to be substituted in a pool of 10,000 viruses if everything is random. All right, each base is substituted in every 10,000 viruses. This is the amazing part. Every person who's infected with HIV makes 10 to the 10th new virus particles a day. Huge replication rate. OK, so doing the math, you're going to have a million viruses produced in a person, in an untreated person every day, that is resistant to one drug. So that's why when you treat a person with one drug, you knock down uh, most of the viruses, but there are a million left, and eventually those grow out and overtake. And especially if they stop taking drug, those amplify very quickly. So this is why single therapy doesn't work, because there's so much virus production and it's so error prone every day. Two drugs, the developing resistance is 10 to the fourth times 10 to the fourth. So it's the same numbers that we used in the previous slide, 10 to the 10th over 10 to the fourth. Now we're doing 10 to the 10th over 10 to the eighth because we have two mutations. So the likelihood of getting two is the, is the product of the two frequencies. So we make 100 viruses a day resistant to two drugs. So you have now an, an untreated person. You treat them with two drugs. They still will have about 100 viruses uh, in them that are resistant. Eventually, those are going to grow out. And our experience is, in fact, that we treat people with two drugs. Within a year, we get resistance. Three drugs, 10 to the 4th times 10 to the 4th times 10 to the 4th is 10 to the 12th. 
So again, you're making 10 to the 10th per day. You, probably, you, you may not have a virus resistant in you to three different drugs. Okay, and that's why this works. But in some people, there are some triple resistant viruses and eventually they grow out. But we have a number of different combinations now of three different inhibitors, so we can simply switch them. And we're so sophisticated, we can actually take an HIV infected person. We can sequence the genome very quickly and see if there are any pre-existing uh, drug resistance mutations in them and pick the right combination of drugs. This is fabulous. This is exactly what medicine should be because there's no point in giving someone a drug to which there are already resistant viruses. And if that person then develops resistant, we can sequence the genomes quickly and reconfigure the treatment. Really, really fabulous. So this is a list of all of the AIDS, HIV approved drugs that are used in the US. There actually may be more. This is the most recent one that I found. And they're highlighted according to mechanism. Uh, nucleoside inhibitors, non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, protease inhibitors. Uh, we have a fusion inhibitor that I didn't tell you about, but there's one of those. Uh, the CCR5 inhibitor, integrase uh, inhibitor. And then we have the multiple pills. The first one was called Atripla, which, com which composed of these three uh, inhibitors, efavirenz, emtricitabine, and tenofovir desoproxyl fumarase. And then we have Complera and uh, strib Stribild, uh, introduced in 2011-2012. So we have three triple uh, medications. Drug discovery continues uh, for all of these targets, uh, and new, new triple combinations are always made. The problem is, of course, that we still get resistance, but more importantly, we never get rid of the provirus. The provirus, as we'll talk about later, is present in a long-lived lymphocyte in individuals, and it's latent, it's silent, it's a persistent infection. If it were the case that every infected cell were actively replicating virus, those cells would die because HIV is cytopathic. But for some reason, in certain types of lymphocytes, the virus goes in, the DNA integrates, and then replication stops, and those cells remain there for your life. They're long-lived cells. So you can wipe out virus with triple therapy, but you'll still have that provirus. And if you stop triple therapy, those cells will produce virus and you'll get infected again. So until we figure out how to clip out those proviruses, which people are working on, we'll talk a little bit about in the AIDS lecture, we can't cure this. But it's the greatest success story in terms of antivirals uh, that we know about. Now, one of the big challenges was getting antivirals to people who need it. You know, here in the US and in Europe, we could get antivirals to infected people and we've drastically reduced infection. But in Sub-Saharan Africa in particular, we were really bad at getting antivirals where they were needed. The top graph shows you uh, the actual and projected numbers of people receiving antiretroviral therapy in different countries. You can see uh, very few people in 2003 and 2006, again, underrepresenting the African region and, only region, and only now in 2012, you know, the African region has the most infected people, and we are treating a lot of people there, and this is increasing. We're trying to get drugs to as many people as possible. Now, um, on the bottom is, showed, is shown how many deaths we believe we have prevented or uh, prevented with and without uh, antiretroviral therapy. So here, the purple line, is going from a million to about 2.5 million deaths. Uh, that would be without antiretroviral therapy. Uh, and then in green, AIDS-related death at the current coverage of, coverage of antiretroviral therapy. You see we had a peak of deaths in 2006 or so. And now it's gone down because we're increasing coverage. A lot of people would have died without any treatment going through the course of uh, HIV infection, but we're saving 4.2 million adult deaths. Maybe more importantly, we're, we're saving children this is from mother to child transmission, pregnant mother to child transmission. The virus can get into the fetus, typically during birth, when there's lots of blood present. Uh, the mother, of course, is HIV positive. The baby gets infected uh, and spends its life being infected with HIV. We have learned that we can treat, we can give the mother a dose of antiretrovirals uh, before birth, lower her load, and that reduces substantially the uh, chance of infecting the, the baby. We've 
saved 800,000 children from being infected with this therapy. So this is a very effective way to uh, save children's lives as well. The problem is we have at the moment uh, 10 to the 16th genomes on the planet, considering everybody who's infected and the number of virus particles in each person. So that means there's resistance to all the retro antiretrovirals that we have, which I have shown to you, and any that we will ever develop. This is a huge number. We could develop hundreds and hundreds of hundreds in the next 10 or 20 years, and there would, already, there would already be resistance to them. So although we save lots of lives, the real key is going to be to get the genome out of people who are infected, and that's something we'll talk about later.